Hi, I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in Fort Lauderdale, Florida at the Gary Severance Collection. This is a collection we've been hearing about for a long time when we were finally able to set up an interview. We're very excited to be here. There's some great cars and you're going to meet the gentleman right now. Gary, come on in here. Hi, Lance. Hi, Gary. Thanks for letting us come into your collection. My pleasure. All right. Beautiful collection. Tell us about it. How did this come about? Well, I'd been a boater all my life, and so uh, around 99 or 2000, I decided to give up boating and uh, tr get into the car collecting. Mm -hmm. I was a neophyte and studied the cars for a couple years and then started buying a few. On that side of the room is the real high buck Packard Cadillac uh, Lincoln. Here's the, the more the 50s, late 40s, 50s stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a real division, and how, how did that come about? Well, being uh, from the 30s in my own lifespan, why I remember the cars that my dad had, and so I have a natural uh, affinity for the cars from the 30s. And growing up, why graduating high school in 1955, well, we have it all inside the room. Mm -hmm. And off camera earlier, you got a little upset with me that I, I wasn't drooling all over the high buck cars and I was headed straight for the Hudson's and, and uh, over this end of the room. Well, that's because you're 10 years younger than oh, me. Okay. So. <laughs> I, well, these it's are, understandable. Yeah, these are the ones that I used to chase after when I was a kid. Yeah, sure. So, well, let's take a look at some of your cars. Let's uh, let's start with some of the early stuff here. Okay. Gary, a, a 32 Lincoln, and it's a KB model. What what is KB about? Well, KB was uh, a special edition that they came out with for about three years, and I believe it was 31, 32, and 33. Uh, it was the largest V12 engine that Lincoln ever made. All the other Ks have a. Uh, V12 engine, I believe it's about four inches shorter on the block. And um, people say that the 32 KB Lincoln and its uh, adjoining years are probably the prettiest looking roadster built in the 30s. And I, I have a tendency to agree with them, although I like uh, the Packards as well. A lot of the viewers right now are wondering if this is an original color on this. I think it is, I do. Uh, there's been some debate about it, but uh, I believe it is. I've seen pictures of uh, some older uh, KBs that uh, were photographs were made back in the 30s, and I have seen green ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The design of this is so striking, so uh, beautiful, and off camera we were talking about the similarities in designs of the cars during that era, and you pointed out something to me that was real interesting. So let's take a look at some cars down the line here, and, and uh, let's run that again. Okay, sounds good. It's interesting to look at these three cars. They're no, each one is a 1934 model, and to look at the differences and the similarities between them. That's very interesting. I like to tell the story. Everyone complains about the cars today all looking alike. And in reality, back in the 30s, they looked alike as well. If you take these three cars, you have a 1934 Auburn, a 34 Packard, and a 34 Cadillac. They're, all three of them are four-door convertibles. And you look at the body design, and it's all the same but basic body. Uh, the rear seat is over the rear axle, and um, if, you didn't, if you took all the, the bling off of them, why, they'd be pretty much the same car. Who, were driving, who was driving these three cars back then? What, the same clientele or a distinctly different clientele? Well, I really don't have any idea, Lance, but uh, I would assume that uh, being higher-end cars that uh, we'd be looking at more affluent uh, owners. Mm -hmm. when, when a Cadillac and a Packard went by each other back then, w were they waving at each other or did one look at the other one and go, oh, it's, I'm sorry, you have to drive a Cadillac or I'm so sorry, you have to drive a Packard? <laughs> well, good question. I'll tell you, the guys that the Packard and the Cadillac owners felt sorry for were the Auburn people. And to me, the Auburn is a prettier car than the Packard or the Cadillacs. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the Auburn was a low price point car, and, and uh, the common feeling was it wasn't worth what, as much as the others because it was a low price car. Of course, Cadillac lived on, Packard lived on into the 50s. What happened to Auburn? Well, they eventually uh, succumbed to the Depression and uh, went out of business in the late 30s, 37 or 38, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, Cord and Auburn, and I believe Duesenberg wasn't very far behind that. Mm -hmm. The comparison in body styles, you have a couple cars down at the end that it's real interesting to look at, they're the same year, but real differences between them. Can we take a look at sure, those? Sure, let's do that. All right. 
A 41 Packard, a 41 Cadillac, same year, big difference in design. Yes, uh, big difference in design, and uh, when you look at them closely, you see that Cadillac had a wider coach, a lower roof line, and they were getting into their horizontal grills. Uh, Packard kept hanging on to this vertical grill way longer than they should have, and uh, drivability, they were about the same. They both drive really nice, but uh, they sold a lot more of those Cadillacs than they did Packard. And the Cadillac looks like it's five to 10 years newer than this. As far as the design, yes, mm -hmm. it does. Mm -hmm. But you say they drive just the same? They drive about the same. Uh, Cadillac had a V8 in there, which people were starting to crave uh, V8s. But uh, the Packard straight eight is just as strong and more dependable probably than the V8. You actually drive your cars. They don't just sit here collecting dust. Absolutely. I drive them and try to exercise them. and. Uh, and that's part of the enjoyment for me is owning them is to be able to drive them. Are some of the cars in your collection real wrestling matches to drive and other ones, I mean, does, does that Cadillac drive more like a 57 Chev or like a, a, a 28 Ford? Well, neither one of them have power steering, so that answers that question, you know. They're, without any power steering, well, they're not like a newer Chevy. But uh, the worst one to drive is the 32 KB Lincoln down there. We looked at earlier with that huge cast iron V12 engine over the front axle. Why? It's almost impossible to turn the steering wheel unless you're moving forward or going backwards. Of your whole collection, this is spectacular, but it's also very staid and conservative looking. It's 31 Marmon, and I'm not familiar with Marmons. Well, the uh, Marmon uh, had built smaller cars from the early 1900s on up to uh, 29, and they designed this car in 29 and 30 and started selling it in 31, 32, and 33, and then properly went bankrupt. So it was just the wrong time to bring it into the market with the Depression. This is a former Pebble Beach winner, I understand. Yes, uh, we finished the restoration on this a couple years ago, and we were up to Pebble Beach, and we did win third prize, and uh, very happy to do so. All these cars uh, in this end of the building are very uh, Pebble Beach worthy, it strikes me. It seems like Pebble Beach at one point was one segment of the hobby, and then you had the other segments, and now it's being more appreciated by everybody. What, what's your thoughts about Pebble Beach in particular? and Concord in general? Well, I'm not uh, a person who's overly familiar. I haven't gone but a couple times, so I really can't answer that question fully for you. But it does seem to me that it is, uh, it has embraced more uh, marquees and different uh, years that uh, they have become a lot more open as far as the uh, available cars to show and what should be shown. Mm -hmm. And they're letting hot rods in occasionally I now. think so, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And a lot of the guys that own cars like these own some uh, pretty spectacular hot rods. I imagine so. The, the engine on this, a running gear? Well, this uh, again is very unusual. Uh, it's the first all aluminum production car engine built in the United States and it's a V16. So it's um, aesthetically, it's a beautiful engine and functionally it functions very well. Some of these older cars, they had a lot of cubic inches, but not a lot of horsepower. What kind of performance you get from something like this? Well, it's very good because of the lightweight. Uh, it's uh, 490 cubic inches, and it generates 200 horses, and you can really feel it when you're driving it. Mm -hmm. They used to say that this was uh, the first car that you didn't have to shift. And what people would do is they'd start out in second gear, from a stop and run it up to 50 miles an hour anywhere in between.
Gary, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, and in the north end of Tacoma was a place called Frisco Freeze, and it was a drive-in where me and all my buddies hung out, and whenever anybody had a cool car, that's where they headed. David Smith had a black 59 Plymouth Fury, and when he drove in with that car, everything stopped. Everybody just, they picked their chins off of the ground. It was so beautiful. This is an excellent example of a 59 Plymouth Fury. Tell us about it. Well, um, it's a color combination that I wasn't in love with at first, but I've grown to really like it. And um, I purchased this from the Art Aster collection here about five years ago. Probably paid too much money for it, but uh, as long as it sits here, it keeps appreciating, as long as I take good care of it. Any of our longtime viewers, if they are paying attention, they'll recognize this car because we did two episodes at Art Astor's mm -hmm. collection and I walked into that Mopar room and saw this across the, and oh boy, I just, same thing, my heart, heart flipped. Um, the design on these, they were so space agey, so Jetson, so, so far out, uh, but they had some build problems with these cars. Well, the big factor was rusting from my, what I remember, and uh, there aren't very many of them left anymore that are in really good condition. Uh, of all of the fins that they came out, I believe that this year was the nicest looking fins. Mm -hmm. They did get kind of extreme with a hump and et cetera, and they got higher, but I, I think this is the nice, as nice fin as, mm -hmm. as any of them. It's got the toilet seat uh, on the trunk. Yes. And uh, yeah, Virgil Exner was uh, was in his stride when they came up with this. Power plant on this? It's a 318. Uh, <clears throat> it's a smaller engine. I believe they, it was a larger one that they offered that year as well. Um, somebody put a two carburation system on it where we but it's uh, not a high performer, but it makes a lot of noise with the muffler system that's on it. Of all the cars that were manufactured in the 50s, one of the, the contenders in my little list for the best design, most beautiful car is a 56 Continental Mark II. This is really spectacular. Tell us about it. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's a very unique car and they're practically hand built from what I understand. Uh, they were trying to come up with something that was better than the Cadillac uh, competition that they had at the time. Uh, this car here is a 1956, the first year they put them out. Uh, you notice they have little air scoops there at the back fender, which um, really didn't account to too much at all. Uh, they later on produced them without the scoops and they still had air conditioning. The original story was is that that was ventilation for the air conditioning system that was in the trunk. But um, other than that, it's just a great land yacht. Yes. I mean, it gives you such a nice ride going down the road. Not necessarily on mountains, but uh, on freeways. Like driving a cloud. I yes, bet. sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unusual color. I haven't seen this on one of these. Yes, I call it my uh, latte mocha uh -huh. car. Um, we bought it. It was partially restored. The interior was uh, reasonable enough to use. So I wanted to kind of connect the exterior with the interior. And uh, none of the factory colors worked. So I was forced to invent my own colors. So this is the latte mocha. Car. So you have a latte and a, and a fudge brownie up yes. here. It's just what a perfect way to start your day. Yeah. <laughs> These were powerful cars, and I understand that as f the Ford company was making them, they they actually ran the motors for quite a while and then took them apart to make sure everything was okay and put them back together and then in the mm. car. I hadn't heard that story, but um, I think that was the first year for this larger V8 and could very well be true that they did do some testing that way. Why do you think they didn't, uh, how come we don't see uh, you know, 10,000 of these cars still left? Well, <clears throat> the price was a big thing. They were now about $10,000 a copy at 1956. That was considerably more than a standard Lincoln or other luxury car. That was a couple of Cadillacs back then. I would think so, yes. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. beautiful car. Well, uh, just a couple cars down, you have something that uh, it, the older it got, the more peculiar it got, but it sure won a lot of races back in its oh, day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's yeah, go look the at that. NASCAR and the yeah. stock cars. Yeah. Any of the viewers that have seen the movie Cars will recognize this. This is the body style, one of the main characters in the movie Cars, and it is a star in your building here. This is really neat. I love orphan cars, and this is a really good one. Tell us about it. 
Well, uh, I'm very proud of this car in, in several different ways. Uh, first of all, in the museum back east where Hudson's are, I believe it's at the Hudson factory, they have this exact same car sitting in the showroom, the same color scheme and pretty well detailed out as it is. Um, as we talked about before, the uh, <clears throat> these cars were probably quicker than all of the competition for 53 and they actually used them a lot for stock car races and NASCAR races as I recall and the club sedan which this is a club sedan was the most popular one to use a little lighter body than the four doors and so they lost a lot of them mm -hmm. and the step down design on, on them oh. gave them the lower center of gravity yeah they, they sure did uh, when I was a kid and I had to walk by the uh, Hudson dealer on the way to school. And in those days, it was a small town in Minnesota, and, and the Hudson dealer was, his uh, front of his store was right up to the sidewalk, you know, and I'd walk by there and I'd look in the window and I'd see those step down designs, you know. And I, oh my God, if I could ever own one of those one day. <laughs> well, you, you scored big with this one. <laughs> the motor on these are the Flathead 6 with the, the twin H carburation system mm -hmm. on them. Very unique looking. It is, and uh, for a six cylinder, it's amazing how they <clears throat> had the torque and uh, the uh, speed that they uh, wanted in the, in the racing field. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a beautiful example. One of my high school classmates back at Stadium High School in Tacoma, Washington had this car, 47 Cadillac, the two-tone gray, and there's a photograph that floats around the internet of him leaning on the fender with Stadium High School in the background, and it is just such a perfect photograph because everything works on it. Everything works on this, tell us about it. Well, it's an older restoration, and um, pretty much a stock car all the way. It had plastic seat covers on it when I bought it, which I think were there almost after it was new. Probably finger hut seat yes, covers. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. I remember finger hut. Uh -huh. In fact, my dad bought a 1950 Nash. It was his first new car, and I bought finger hut seat covers uh -huh. for him and then regretted I had yeah. to sit on those plastic yeah, things. Yeah. But uh, anyway, getting back to this car, Lance, uh, it um, drives really nice. It has a great gear ratio for the V8. 
And um, it's a three-speed transmission, which makes it more desirable than the old hydromatics. It is class and, and sporty for that year at the same time. I think so. It's, uh, I believe it has just about every, every addition after market thing that you could put on it, whether the spotlights or the, the uh, visor or the fog lights up in front. It uh, is nicely decorated my, in my view. I wonder if the executive or the purchaser of something like this in 1947 bought this on his way up to getting the four-door sedan or already had the four-door sedan and decided he wanted something a little sporty. Oh, I tell you, I, I don't think I would just stop at the four-door sedan. Uh, I think I'd go to this one and quit there. Unless you had a jillion kids you had to put in the back seat. Yeah. Uh, power plant on this? It's a V8, a standard uh, Cadillac V8. And plenty of power. Yes, plenty of power. power. Actually, they used that same V8 in the uh, Second World War and for the tanks. I think they had like four of them in a tank to drive the tanks. And they were very well uh, long-lived and well-built. Mm -hmm. Well, out of your collection, I think uh, this is also a contender for uh, the coveted Lance Lambert Liked It Best well, Award. We look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a 55 Buick convertible. I had a 57 Buick convertible that was red and flashy like this, and it was one of the most beautiful cars I ever owned and one of the worst running cars I ever owned. I just got a bad one, but uh, I, I probably got the only bad Buick. They were great cars. Well, being red, did you collect a lot of tickets with it? Uh, my dad was a cop, so I managed oh, to get out of those tickets guy. a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, this car uh, has the, the uh, special, the Buick special body with the Roadmaster engine, which makes it a century. All right, so you've got the fourth porthole Four here. Fourth portholes, yeah. which would normally be on the Roadmaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember as kids, that's how we'd check out the models, is counting the uh, portholes. Right. But, um, I bought this car, it was pretty well restored, but it needed a new interior. It had a red and white interior, and I'm not much on, on white interior. Mm -hmm. So we put a new interior in it, and it's a, it's a great running car. I love the Dynaflow. It has a variable pitch Dynaflow for that year, and it uh, really makes a difference over a standard Dynaflow. So I found the one guy that liked a Dynaflow. Yeah, so far it's worked out. I had to have it rebuilt when I bought the car, but uh, running great. Uh -huh. You mentioned restoration. You have, I mean, all these cars to my eyes look like, you know, number one cars are close to it. How did that come about? Well, I like to drive the cars, but I also want them to look good, and so I call them uh, good-looking driver cars or whatever. The crew there, they take care of everything, paint, upholstery, the whole thing? I have, I have a full-time restoration guy that works for me, and uh, he's... Uh, he does everything but upholstery. Mm -hmm. He can rebuild an engine or he can paint a car and everything in between. Part of the old car hobby is all the stuff that goes with it, the gas pumps and the neon signs and the petroleum signs. You've done a really good job here of reproducing a Sinclair station. How'd this come about? Well, it uh, goes back to my youth and my high school days. I worked at a Sinclair station and uh, so it taps into my history and. Uh, makes me feel good looking at it. Uh -huh. And it's not just a, a false front here, you've got a lot going on back there. Yes, we have an office and uh, some memorabilia in there, some history of what we've been doing here. Uh -huh. Well, what you've been doing here is absolutely fantastic. So Gary, I want to thank you very much for allowing us to come into your collection here. It's a real honor. My pleasure. All right, thank you. And thank you for watching the show this week. If you don't watch the show, we don't have a show. So we appreciate you watching every week. And until next time, we'll see you then. Bye-bye.